Hello, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us today for our Freshwater Stewardship Community webinar. I am here today with Dr. Roshira Castaneda, and she is an aquatic research biologist at Fisheries and Oceans Canada. We're very excited to have her as our second speaker of the 2024 webinar series. My name is Monica Seidel. I'm the Communications and Fundraising Manager at Watersheds Canada. And I'm joined by my coworker, Nicole Dubay, who is our freshwater health coordinator. And she is going to be the hidden tech person today. So if you're having any problems with hearing us or if the slides aren't showing for you, you have your internet drop and you wanna catch up on what's been missed in between you coming back onto the call, you can private message Nicole in Zoom and she'll be able to help you with all of your tech questions. For those of you who maybe aren't familiar with Watersheds Canada, we are a national charity that is headquartered in Perth, Ontario. So it's about an hour away from Ottawa. Our focus is in delivering freshwater stewardship programming, whether that's outreach programs or habitat restoration programs. So you can see a sampling of our work on this slide. We do everything from outdoor education with public libraries, schools, and community groups. We also do direct habitat restoration, like our natural edge program, which does shoreline plantings along lakes, rivers, and riparian areas. In our bottom right, we have an example of our winter fish restoration project. So we do spawning bed enhancements, and we will be doing some of those actually later this month across central eastern Ontario. And then in the bottom left corner, we have our Love Your Lake program, which is delivered in collaboration with the Canadian Wildlife Federation. And this is a shoreline assessment program. So we're going across a water body and looking at different factors on a property that would be contributing to the health of the water body and then producing customized reports for each of those property owners so that they can take action to protect their lake health. So those are a couple of our programs and Nicole's gonna put in the chat the link if you would like to check out any of those programs more, possibly bring them to your community. You can learn about them at watersheds.ca forward slash r hyphen work. A couple of other things that I'd like to bring everyone's attention to. The first is our symbolic adoption program. So we have a number of different adoptions that are available on our site where you can directly impact habitat conservation as well as promoting different species awareness, especially species at risk that live along our lakes and rivers. So you can make a symbolic adoption. These are great really for any occasion. Each adoption comes with a blank honor card that you can personalize and give as a gift as well as a five by seven postcard with the artwork of the species or ecosystem that your donation is helping. So if you are interested in looking at those, you can go to watersheds.ca forward slash gifts. It doesn't feel like spring planting season just yet, but we are coming up on our spring planting season through the natural edge. So if you are a shoreline property owner or an agricultural property owner, I encourage you to contact our natural edge team. The infographic on the slide here is for Eastern Ontario, but we have regional delivery partners across Canada this year, thanks to some funding from RBC Tech for Nature. So I encourage you, if you are interested in restoring the riparian zone, so that shoreland area right by the water with some native plants and looking for some guidance on how you can protect the property shoreline from things like erosion and overland runoff, I really encourage you to reach out to Chantel on our natural edge team and she'll be able to point you in the direction of how you could naturalize your property this spring. And next we have a new awareness toolkit that's coming out in the coming weeks regarding road salts and how their impacts are changing our freshwater ecosystems. So everyone who's on the call today will be automatically on the freshwater stewardship community mailing list. And so you'll be receiving free information from our education toolkit in the coming weeks regarding road salts and freshwater health and different 
actions that we can be taking in our communities individually and on a community level with our municipalities in order to help protect everyone's health during the winter, but also the long-term health of our freshwater ecosystems. So that's something to look forward to in your inbox soon. The program that we are here for today is the Freshwater Stewardship Community. So this program has been running since 2021. Since then, we've hosted 44 webinars and created 36 handouts. So these handouts are a summary of the presentations that were made and different action steps that can be taken on the given topic. So if you are newer to the freshwater stewardship community, everything is archived on our website and organized by different categories. And it's all free for you to use however you see fit and for you to share as widely as you can. So you can go to watersheds.ca forward slash freshwater hyphen stewardship and access all of those resources. A couple of our different headings like invasive species, native wildlife, shoreline protection, and family resources can be found there. So you'll see these graphics on the same page where you signed up for today's session and you just keep scrolling down to the bottom of the page and you can click on these icons and then access all of the past resources. We do have two other webinars happening later this month in time for Invasive Species Awareness Week. So this is the last week of February each year, and we'll be hosting two different webinars. So again, on the same page where you registered for today's session, you'll see information for these two sessions happening on Wednesday, February 28th and Thursday, February 29th. So I encourage you to register for those with Almost all of our webinars, we send the recording and all of the resources to everyone who registers. So even if you can't attend live, it's recommended that you register so that you can access all of those resources straight from your inbox. So we'll now get into today's presentation. So Roshira is a research biologist at Fisheries and Oceans Canada in the Pacific region, where she focuses her research on freshwater species at risk. Her PhD focused on developing the use of underwater cameras to detect and quantify rare freshwater fishes in Canada and South Africa. Her master's research was focused on invasive species and microplastics in the St. Lawrence River in Ontario. So with that, I will pass it over to you. Great, thanks, sorry. I'm still trying to get used to Zoom after being on teams for so long. Um, could I share my screen now? Yep, you can just take right over. All right, let me figure. That is, yeah. And I'm just confirming with you, Monica, you're seeing the presentation slide. That's right, you're good to go. Perfect. <clears throat> All right, well, thank you so much uh, for the invitation, Monica, and all of you for joining. Um, so today I'll be um, walking you through some of the research I've done throughout my PhD, and then uh, just giving some recommendations um, to scientists on how to use, um, or researchers how to use underwater video cameras, but also touch on how um, local community scientists can use it in their watersheds. Um, whether it's a pond in your backyard or a stream that you'd like to understand what the community composition is. Um, so I'll just jump into the intro. Um, sorry, not switching slides. There we go. So as we probably already know, we are facing a biodiversity crisis. Species are suffering accelerated rates of extinction due to human activity be it climate change, um, habitat destruction because of agriculture or urbanization, and invasive species. These extinctions are happening across all ecosystems, um, although some argue that proportionally, uh, rates of declines in freshwater biodiversity are greater than their terrestrial counterparts. And this is of particular concern as we heavily rely on water for agriculture, for drinking, and navigation. Further available freshwater resources make up only 0.1% of water on Earth, but holds a quarter of global uh, vertebrate diversity and almost half of all fish diversity. Thus, they're important contributors to global diversities as a whole. 
Biodiversity as a whole generates different traits, which have different functions, maintaining ecosystem integrity. And the diversity of freshwater fishes provides many ecosystem functions that we rely on. So maintaining food web structure, cycling nutrients, and engineering habitats. Therefore, the conservation of freshwater fishes is crucial for maintaining freshwater habitats, global diversity, and ecosystem services. Of course, despite the importance of freshwater ecosystems for sustaining such diverse life, um, they are one of the most threatened ecosystems due to exploitation, uh, requiring more conservation and restoration effort. Another neat thing about freshwater fishes themselves is that um, they're really important to ecosystems and they can reflect habitat integrity. So one example where fishes are used as a metric for ecosystem health is the use of the index of biotic integrity, which I will refer to as IBI for short. Um, and so using this um, system, different IBI scores can tell you how healthy uh, uh, the habitat is. Uh, one of the metrics they use is species richness. Uh, for example, the number of native species in, in, in a water body, the number of centrarchids in a, number, in a water body. So centrarchids are the basses and sunfishes, the number of in, species that are intolerant to decreasing water quality. So just as an example, black red horse is very intolerant to declines in water quality. And so these all have positive um, impacts on the score. So the more of these types of fishes you have in the environment, the healthier your ecosystem. We also want to consider how many non-Indigenous species might be in an area. And the number of non-Indigenous species actually has a negative score, as you can see here, on the index of uh, biotic integrity. So the more non-Indigenous species you are, the less healthy your um, water body is considered to be and also the number of native saprinids, which are actually leucicids now. Um, but essentially it's where, it's the group that have the minnows and the shiner. So I'm just putting this out as an example as to why we want to understand the composition of our fish communities, uh, because they could be helpful in assessing the health of a water body. But of course, uh, being able to sample fishes can be difficult without the appropriate gear and permits. Unfortunately, in Canada, multiple threats have reduced fish populations to the point that they have been evaluated as at risk of extinction and have been listed for protection under the Species at Risk Act or SARA, which is a federal law. There are about 75 freshwater fishes that are currently listed under SARA and conservation and recovery of these species is a priority for the federal government. Of course, to be able to successfully conserve and recover species, we need to understand their distribution and set up monitoring protocols to track any changes in the population. And so this brings us to, I guess, kind of the topic of today, uh, monitoring and sampling freshwater fishes. So I saw a few names that I recognized uh, in the audience. Obviously they would know what these uh, conventional sampling methods are, but I thought I would just give an overview of how we currently sample for fishes in our water bodies. So we have just many different examples, but for example, we have electrofishing, seining, and trapping. So in this case, up here in this picture, uh, the top left, we have backpack electrofishing. We could also use electrofishing on a boat for larger water bodies where an electric uh, current is sent into the water and the fish is stunned uh, and temporarily immobilized, which allows the netters, uh, folks on the side here to scoop the fish. And then once we're done, electrofishing a whole site, we uh, identify and enumerate them. We also have another active sampling method here called seining. Um, so here we use a large net. This is a bag seine where we pull the seine across the whole watershed, uh, the water body and collect the fish that end up in this bag. Uh, and once we're done sampling, we collect, enumerate and identify all the fishes. There are also passive sampling methods uh, such as the spike nets or minnow traps where the traps are placed in the water for a certain amount of time. The fishes are allowed to move around and end up in these traps. And then after an allocated amount of time that you've decided, you go back, uh, collect the fish, count and identify. So one common theme to all these methods, whether they're passive or active, um, is that it requires a physical handling of the fish. And studies have shown that handling fishes uh, or individuals 
uh, can increase their stress and also cause some mortality in some cases. And some of them can be acute at the moment um, with electrofishing or seining, um, or they can be uh, happening later where they have an increased stress response and that affects their condition uh, or their ability to feed in, in, at a later time. And this is, might not be such an issue with very healthy, robust populations of fish, um, but it could be something of, um, that could be very detrimental to imperiled fishes. So fishes that are uh, under the Species at Risk Act. So handling these fishes, wanna, we wanna keep handling these fishes to a minimum. So there's gonna be a trade-off between monitoring for these um, imperiled fishes and the potential sampling harm. And so, you know, as a conservation biologist, we're always, wondering and trying to figure out better ways that we could sample the distribution and population abundances of fishes without uh, increasing any stress or harm or um, exacerbating any threats that they may be under already. And so this is what brings us to some of the novel non-harmful non sampling methods for freshwater ecosystems. And when I'm saying novel, I mean for freshwater ecosystems. Um, there's a huge body of literature on using underwater cameras and the equivalent of snorkeling, say scuba diving in marine environments, but they haven't been tested as robustly or um, as much in freshwater ecosystems. And that could be attributed to a few different things. Um, marine ecosystems tend to be very open, blue clear water environments making these types of visual methods ideal uh, for sampling fishes uh, whereas freshwater environments tend to be a bit more isolated and small making it harder to get a full field of view but also um, have different water colors whether a stream is in the headwaters uh, in an area where this uh, has a lot of tannins or inputs from repair an area causing it to be a darker color. So it's tannin stained, which would make it harder for visual assessments of fishes underwater and issues of turbidity. Um, so freshwater systems also just tend to be more red shifted, making it more difficult to, to um, identify fish and see through the water. But we're testing those, um, those methods now. And there's also environment, environmental DNA or eDNA, which is where we collect water samples from a water body, we bring them back to the lab, we filter them, or we filter on site now with these uh, new backpack uh, eDNA samplers, and then we use molecular techniques to identify which species, which, what DNA is in the water and which species, using bioinformatics, which species that belongs to. Um, so these novel Narhapo methods allow for the study of rare cryptic species, uh, allow us to get an idea of community composition, behaviors, population abundances, well, behaviors not for eDNA, but just generally. And as I mentioned, they're ethical. There's no sampling or direct harm uh, to the fish community. So knowing that there are these non-harmful sampling methods and we've been using these that have been coming up in the literature in the past 10 to 15 years, and we have these conventional sampling methods that we've been using for decades. My main research question um, for my PhD was how do conventional methods and underwater cameras compare for the detection of freshwater fishes? So down here, um, this is just a, a citation of the publication that refers to this question and what I'll be talking about uh, to, get at, to get some answers. So for this study, I focused on a um, rare fish, red side dace, Clonosimus elongatus, which is a stream dwelling cold water minnow in southwestern Ontario. Uh, it's experienced over 50% declines in population over the past 10 years. It's listed as endangered uh, under the Species at Risk Act and um, also endangered under the Ontario Endangered Species Act. Um, this minnow is quite unique in the fact that it's an insectivore that feeds on terrestrial or aerial insects. So it's one of the only minnow species that actually jumps out of the water to catch insects as they fly by, which is makes them very important conduits of energy between terrestrial and uh, aquatic ecosystems. Um, however, they are reliant on other common minnow species such as common china or creek chub as they use their nests uh, to lay their eggs where they get fertilized. So they're reliant on um, the community of fishes to be able to survive and reproduce. 
So this was my study species um, for my one of my chapters of my PhD. And I sampled for these this freshwater fish across its historical um, uh, distribution. So starting up in the top left on St. Joseph Island near Sault Ste. Marie, down to some tributaries of Lake Huron, all the way to um, the east, uh, the Rouge River out uh, in some watersheds in Lake Ontario. So I sampled 69 different sites, which which was about 25 different streams across the range. And at each of these sites, I um, had a minimum of a 40 meter transect um, that intersected uh, different parts or different habitats of the stream. So we would, I would try to target um, an air, a site that would have a pool, some runs and riffles to try to get as much a habitat di um, diversity that I can while sampling. <clears throat> so it's at least 40 meters and it would get longer and longer if we needed to um, expand the, the site to ensure that we had the different uh, types of stream habitats. And then from there, we divided the site into four different uh, transects and placed an underwater camera facing upstream at each of these four transects. We allowed the cameras to record for about 30 minutes. Uh, we chose a 30 minute mark for several reasons. There were some studies coming out of South Africa um, who are kind of pioneering some of this, the use of underwater cameras for freshwater systems that showed that there was um, community or species richness saturation around the 15 to 20 minute mark. But given that Canada uh, or in these streams at least that we were working on, we knew we had higher species diversity. So we wanted to uh, try to capture that. So we decided that 30 minutes, we would add an extra 10 minutes to that uh, recommended time frame. Uh, and also it was considering battery life and the fact that we wanted to do multiple sites uh, in a day. So just lots of different um, factors went into picking the 30 minute um, recording time. So facing upstream and then, so after 30 minute recording uh, time of the cameras, we collected them and then used conventional sampling methods. So at 40 of the sites, um, we did cameras first followed by backpack electrofishing and then one pole of the same net across the full site. And this would allow us to compare all three methods in um, how well they detect red site days. We were only able to do that at 40 of the 69 sites because we did this work in the summers of 2016 and 2017. And if uh, some of you were in south, southern, um, southwestern Ontario um, in the summer of 2016, there was a huge drought. And so water levels were very low, um, meaning that the water temperatures were also quite high because of the smaller volume. So we didn't wanna stress um, the fish more um, than they already were because of this higher water temperature, low volume of water and high temperatures. So we would only do cameras and backpack electrofishing if the water temperatures were above 20 degrees Celsius so as to not just continue to induce stress. The next year we were able to do most of the sites um, with all three methods. So that's why we have two different types of, um, of data sets in a sense. So we have 40 sites with all three, um, excuse me, all three um, methods and 69 sites uh, with always had cameras and backpack electrofishing and sometimes the same as well. At each of these sites, we also collected habitat variables. We wanted to see what habitat variables might affect our ability to detect these species, uh, the species using the different methods. So we would take water quality parameters like dissolved oxygen, conductivity, turbidity, uh, and then at each transect, uh, it was a modified OSAP protocol. Uh, essentially, we would um, take depth measurements like along the four different transects and um, estimate the sediment um, percentage. So after um, all this field work, we'd go back to the lab for the winter, cozy up with <laughs> some hot chocolate or something and just watch lots and lots of fish videos. So this is one of the fish videos that we collected. You can see it's actually very turbid, um, has a lot of suspended solids in there. But um, 
what I like about this video is that you can actually still identify some of these fishes. So here we have a northern red belly dace, the double stripes. We see lots of red side dace swimming around. Um, I think I saw a couple of creek chub, probably a common shiner there. Um, so it would just be sitting in front of the camera, uh, in front of a laptop and uh, enumerating all these fishes. Obviously, as you can see, it's a lot of work. It's quite time consuming and you need to have really, really good and sharp identification skills, uh, which I think you would only get by watching these videos over and over again. Um, but that being said, it's so much, has so much information. So originally I think we planned on trying to do the full community a detection of all the community, um, fish community, but because of the amount of work that was going into this, uh, we decided to just focus on red side days. So here's a little uh, red side days in the bottom right corner. Um, so we did that throughout the summer and then uh, we collected all that data and then tried to figure out what the detection probabilities were for each of these methods. So we used um, a statistical technique called occupancy models which is a type of statistical analysis that allows you to estimate the detection probability. So what is the probability that will detect the species using different gear types? So this, these are the results for the 40 sites where we had all three methods. So this is averaged over all the sites. And what we found is that underwater cameras had quite a high detection probability for red site days. So almost 0.75. So on the y-axis is detection probability zero to one, or if you were to convert it to percentage zero to 100. And across the x-axis here, we have our different sampling methods. Staining also was quite high, despite the fact that we did it after backpack electrofishing at about 0.6 or 0.7. And backpack electrofishing had the lowest detection probability of all the methods at about 0.4. Uh, or 40% of the time we capture wet side days using backpack electrofishing, which I find very interesting because backpack electrofishing is actually the more common use, uh, common uh, method to um, um, detect uh, minnows in general. So then knowing that, you know, underwater cameras had the higher detection probability, but we wanted to know what variables might affect the camera's ability to detect the species themselves. So of the top model, the occupancy model, the statistical model I use with all 69 sites now, since we had cameras at all 69 sites, we found the detection probability, um, so our ability to detect the species decreases quite rapidly with increasing turbidity. And turbidity, uh, we haven't measured here in nephilometric turbidity units. So essentially zero to five is usually the, it's, it's a unit of water clarity. Um, so zero to five is usually where we have our drinking water. So very clear, uh, crystal clear water. Uh, and then as we increase, that's when the water starts to get darker and darker. So more, either more sediment uh, suspended in it. Um, so as we increase in turbidity, uh, the less transparent the water is. So we go from almost 100% being able to detect um, red side days when very, very clear water and it rapidly decreases as the water transparency decreases. So if you wanted to compare that to the detection probability of SANES, so we said SANING had about 0.7 or 0.65 uh, detection probability, then we'd want to sample with underwater cameras only under 14 NTU. So this would have a kind of a, an equivalent detection probability to SANENET. And about 14 NTU is approximately 40 centimeters of visibility. Now, if you wanted the same detection probability as um, backpack electrofishing, which was around 0.4, we'd want to sample below 19 NTUs um, to have an equivalent um, detection probability to backpack e-fishers. And 19 NTU is approximately 30 centimeters of visibility. And the centimeter, the visibility depends on who was measuring it, et cetera, et cetera. But essentially um, anything that's 30 centimeters, if you can't see more than 30 centimeters in the water body, cameras really don't do very well at detecting the species or don't do as well as conventional sampling methods. Now, I don't know if you remember what I said when I was talking about our field work, we actually put four cameras across the stream. 
And we did that to be able to capture as much habitat variability, but we also didn't know how many cameras we needed to get a high detection probability. We went with four because that's how many we have, what we budgeted for, different reasons. But then when I uh, reran the occupancy modeling, looking at how many, how what happens when we randomly remove a camera from a site, we went from a high detection probability of 0.8 to down to uh, a detection probability of almost 30% or 0.3 with only three cameras. And this was a stark difference. So essentially what we found is that we need a minimum of four cameras across the stream length um, to be able to have that high detection probability. Once you remove the one camera, uh, our detection probability plummets for red side days. Now we don't know if adding more cameras would increase detection probability or if that would be oversampling. We didn't, um, we weren't able to go back out and test that, but that is still something up for, for debate or if someone wants to test it out, how many cameras do you really need in an area to capture, to increase your detection probability, that's still an unknown question. So a minimum of four, I would say, if you're sampling stream sites. So the conclusions of the study, so my main question was, do underwater cameras have detection probabilities comparable to conventional sampling methods? Yes. So we saw that, yes, they were as effective as conventional methods conventional methods. And the next question is, can cameras be used in standardized monitoring programs? I would argue, yes, they can be. Um, as long as, the, as you take into account the different covariates or the different variables, environmental variables that might affect the detection of the cameras. So ideally, you would really just use the underwater cameras when your water clarity uh, is more than 40 uh, centimeters in visibility or 14 NT, less than 14 NTU um, to be able to confidently say that your detection probability or your ability to cap catch the fish is equal to the conventional sampling methods that are currently in our monitoring programs. So other conclusions of using underwater cameras in streams in southwestern Ontario, and I assume this goes for many, well, a lot of streams across Canada. Um, they're great tools, they're non-invasive, accessible, verifiable. Uh, they're science-saving in the field. So there's less field work prep, so you can sample more sites and there's no sampling restraints. Of course, you wanna make sure that your equipment is clean and dry before moving water bodies. I know there's sometimes viruses across watersheds in Southwestern Ontario. So you don't wanna be transferring equipment between water bodies, but you know, if you follow the proper cleaning protocols, that shouldn't be an issue. However, it could be very time consuming after the fact. So watching these videos, um, this can be done off season when maybe it's a bit slower in the lab or in the office um, uh, and you need really strong identification skills. Now, that this is not to deter anyone. These are just the pros and cons of the cameras. But I do believe with the crazy amount of progress that folks have done in, auto, in AI, in machine learning, that eventually there will be some kind of software that will be able to help identify um, some of these fishes. But for now, if you don't have strong identification skills, I think potentially putting up your still images on iNaturalist could be a really good uh, way to invoke some of the community knowledge across the internet. Um, so I was just going through iNaturalist to see if there were any underwater images of freshwater fishes because there's tons for marine fishes. All these scuba divers go out, take pictures of fish and pose them for identification. And I did find a few for freshwater systems. So here I found a person posted a picture of a pumpkin seed and a whole bunch of different um, experts, taxonomists, naturalists uh, were able to help identify this fish. So this might be a really strong tool to help with uh, confirming identification of some of these uh, freshwater fishes that are a little less known. So earlier, I also talked about other non-harmful methods. Um, so I talked about snorkel surveys, eDNA, and underwater cameras. So that was another question that we wanted to ask um, during my PhD. So do other non-harmful methods have equal detection probabilities to underwater cameras? So if we have different resources, different abilities, can we use these different methods and how do they compare? So this is another study that was published in Frontiers in Environmental Sciences uh, in 2020, if anyone's interested in more details. 
So for this study, uh, this was actually done in South Africa. So for my PhD, I was at University of Toronto and at the South African Institute for Aquatic Biodiversity, where they were really trying to pioneer the use of underwater cameras. And I think you can see why they want to use underwater cameras or eDNA or snorkel surveys, because a lot of these study locations were in far remote headwater streams. So picture on the right, uh, a here, this is some of the stuff we had to trek over. So we had to climb over boulders, walk through streams, which would make it, which would be almost impossible with heavy wet nets or unsafe or a big backpack electrofisher trying to get through uh, some of these sites. Picture B is some of the sites we had to swim through to get upstream to the headwaters. And the reason why we want to get to the headwaters is because a lot of the main stem rivers of these watersheds had invasive species, so bass, catfish, that actually wiped out um, some of the native minnows and other fishes uh, from these areas. So they were taking refuge up into the headwaters. So we want to know where these fishes are, how well they're doing. So we have to get up to the headwaters. So we're trying to test different, um, uh, more transportable methods in the field. So we did in two watersheds, the Cocoa watershed and the Swartkops watershed uh, just outside of Port Elizabeth, South Africa. And these waters were incredibly clear, so we did not have issues of turbidity at all, luckily. Um, so we were focused on two native fishes, the Eastern Cape redfin, which are actually two separate species now, but um, you can see here in this picture, the red fins are obviously the red fins. And uh, we were also focused on Cape Kerper, which I think, so Eastern Ray kept Eastern, the red fins are endangered at their IUCN and Cape Kerper are data deficient. So we always need more information. So the Cape Kerper are um, these labyrinth fish here, this one here um, in these water bodies. So field methods, we use underwater cameras, snorkel surveys and environmental DNA. Um, we sampled almost every pool going upstream with both snorkel and cameras, um, but first we always went up and collected our DNA so that we wouldn't cross contaminate between sites. And we took less eDNA samples because we needed a minimum, I think of 500 meters between pools to um, have some confidence that um, the molecules that we're picking up in the downstream pool aren't necessarily connected to the upstream ones um, so that there's enough spatial um, separation to have independent sites. And of course, just like in Ontario, uh, we took a lot of habitat measurements, so depth, um, sediment type, et cetera. So what did we find? So this is our model average detection probability estimates for the non-harmful methods. And I use the same statistical analysis, the occupancy model. So the um, um, axes are reversed here. So we have detection probability on the X is zero, being we don't detect them at all, to one being we detect them 100% of the time. And then we have our different, um, uh, sorry, our different um, methods. In this case, for cameras, we only had one per site. Uh, snorkel, we did a zigzag across and back, uh, counting all the fishes. And then eDNA, we had three eDNA samples per site, um, and plus one field control per site. So eDNA, these are the individual one filter, and then the total is when we um, put all the filters together, our detection probability. So what we find is that snorkel and camera, so the visual methods were really, really high in detecting the red fin species and lower for the, the Kate Kerper. But for eDNA, we had almost equal detection probabilities for both fishes. And this is explained just by because of the behavior and biology of these fishes. So the red fins tend to school in large um, uh, schools of over a hundred individuals. They're very curious fish. So once you know we put a camera in the water, they would swarm to the camera to see what it was. Not very good against predation, I assume. Um, or if I would get into snorkel, they would be kind of like all over my face, uh, so very visible, whereas Cape Kerpers tend to be more um, weight and pounds predator fish. Um, so they tend to be shyer, tend to be hiding either in macrophytes behind boulders. And so they wouldn't pass in front of a camera as often because that's just not their behavior to swim around as much. 
uh, or they would swim away from the snorkeler. Um, so uh, just the sheer behaviors of these fishes um, meant that we had very different detection probabilities between snorkels and cameras, but we still had very high detection probability regardless, about 0.7. And eDNA, uh, because it's a passive method that does not require any behavior, um, had equal detection probability pretty much. So which method should be used to detect rare fishes? Both visual methods um, detected IUCN listed fishes very, very well. eDNA had slightly lower detection probability, but of course, as I mentioned, there were less sites sampled. We had to have a uh, wider uh, distance between the pools. So sometimes uh, we would sample the snorkel with cameras in between these. So we just had more data to go on as well. And all three were transportable, but the required different expertise. So this is just like kind of a quick pros cons list of the different methods. So underwater camera pros was um, they're able to capture behavior and habitat use of fishes and you can store information and you can verify it. And I think that's one of the unique things about underwater cameras is that it's verifiable data. One issue is obviously storage. Uh, you need lots of um, hard drives or some sort of cloud, which could get expensive to maintain. Cons, the equipment can be costly. It's more time consuming in the lab, but you have more confidence in your identification and there's no spatial reference. So I didn't talk about abundance in this talk because we're still trying to figure out what the best abundance metrics are. Um, but given that there's no spatial reference with cameras, unless you have some sort of ruler or something, it's really hard to calculate or get a, an idea of abundance. Snorkel surveys, you can get abundance estimates, you can count them all up with some degree of error, but um, you're sampling the whole environment and you get immediate results. A con to that is that it's not verifiable and you need high level of uh, fish ID skills to be able to confidently um, acquire this data. And of course you may disturb the fish behavior. Uh, so as I mentioned, the Cape Kerper and the red fins had two very different behaviors to my presence, uh, which could affect our detection probabilities. And eDNA, although we had less uh, sampled sites, we still, we got all the community data. So if you're using a meta barcoding approach, you can capture everything in the environment. However, it's susceptible to contamination, especially if you're going out into very remote areas. You don't get abundance estimates, but there are a lot of intelligent scientists out there trying to answer that question, and it could be very costly lab. Consumables are expensive, sequencing's expensive. Um, so pros and cons to all of these. And what thing I didn't mention is that um, we were actually able to capture some invasive species, uh, some, some cryptic species. So uh, the catfish that are usually just um, active at night, we did capture it on an underwater camera during the day and eDNA will always capture um, all animals regardless of whether they're nocturnal or, um, or diurnal. So um, there's just different methods uh, for different uh, questions. So the conservation implications of underwater cameras in general. So monitoring for imperiled fishes can be done more regularly. So you can go out more often. A lot of the um, permitting under uh, SARA, the Species at Risk Act only allows you to monitor uh, fish habitats maybe every three to five years. Um, so you can lose some information within those years or capture any uh, reductions in population distribution on a short scale. So with cameras, you can just go out every year and resample the same area so you have a more continuous data set. <clears throat> uh, safely and more readily identify habitats to conserve and restore. Uh, as I mentioned, SANES could have a bit of a destructive um, impact on habitats if you're pulling and stirring up all the sediments. Um, we could also quickly identify invasive, invasive species to contain and eradicate. So early detection, rapid response of, of invasive species um, is usually the ideal um, method to eradicate them, um, but we have to capture them early. So the more we put these cameras out more often, the more likely we are to capture them on video. And they capture red goby great. Uh, we use them up in the, the Credit River watershed uh, for another student's project. And so they're just generally great for aiding in the protection of our freshwater ecosystems. So I'm just gonna finish off um, with some recommendation and gaps. Um, 
for using underwater and remaining gaps for using underwater cameras for scientific purposes. So I collaborated with a PhD student. Uh, we were a whole bunch of different underwater camera experts um, that got together uh, and this PhD student, Matthew Har Harwood, uh, led a full um, lit review on how to use freshwater cameras in, sorry, fresh cameras in freshwater environments. So he did a really, really great job of collecting all this information. And so some of the recommendations are, you know, we want to continue using action cameras. They're affordable, they're sturdy. Um, they're the most commonly used um, camera in the freshwater literature. And these are just some of the recommendations that frame for second resolution field of view. I didn't really talk much about acclimation time. Most of the studies didn't have acclimation time incorporated. I didn't uh, calculate my acclimation time for mine, which in hindsight I probably should have. I just waited for some of the sediment to settle out because once you step into a stream sometimes. But I never like calculated how long that took. So that, and it was different for different environments. Some places was very cobbly or bouldery, so there was no sediment kick up. Other times there's a lot of silt. Um, so it varied based on the habitat or the area in the stream we're replacing them. So we still need to test how acclimation affects uh, abundance or um, detection probabilities. Deployment time, we recommended 60 minutes because that's the most common and standard time in marine system, which has been studied and tried and true, um, but it hasn't been really studied or determined in freshwater ecosystems. Um, there, are, I would say, I think there was an equal number of studies that had a 30 minute time mark uh, and then the deployment time just varied depending on uh, the study and different uh, reasons for that. Um, but we would say over collection of data is preferred until sampling efficiency is assessed systematically in fresh waters. So there's still lots of work to be done on that. So determining optimal sampling time versus trying to get species abundances, et cetera. And for video analysis, obviously right now we have to rely on human reviewers most accessible option in terms of cost uh, and to test. So we still have to test the cost efficiency of new and emerging softwares. And I really hope uh, some of the machine learning stuff um, gets incorporated into freshwater um, biology to try to limit, shorten the amount of time needed um, to review all these videos. So that's for scientific purposes. What about for using underwater cameras by community scientists? So I would argue for community scientists, because you're not doing a full um, scientific or research study, I think 30 minutes could be sufficient um, as this was a common cutoff for many of the studies in freshwater systems. So just throw your camera in there with the different recommended factors. Um, in lakes, we ha I haven't really, or ponds, I haven't really studied this, but obviously try to place the camera towards a more open area or in the macrophytes if you want to, you won't see as much macrophytes, but if you want to see if any animals are using macrophytes, that might be a good idea. Um, and if you're lacking expertise, I would highly recommend posting still pictures to iNaturalist. Um, but also other considerations, I think we should think about that weren't in the study were, for sampling local watersheds is kind of the results of my study. So I'm just bringing back up um, these uh, figures where turbidity had a huge impact on our ability to detect fishes with underwater cameras. So trying to stick to clear water might be a good idea for community scientists or pick areas where there's not a lot of siltation to kind of kick up. And also the number of cameras. Obviously we had a huge drop in detection probability when we removed, when we went from four cameras to three cameras. Of course, I don't expect everyone to go out and buy four expensive cameras, but I would suggest that, um, you know, if you place a camera in one area of your pond or local water body to move that and um, sample multiple locations within the same sites. So, to inc so even though it's not simultaneously collecting uh, the information, at least you're covering lots of different potential habitats or refugees within your water bodies. And another fun thing I want to talk about, um, about freshwater environments is that we don't really get to look at what's going on under water in freshwater. So I love this video because well, here was a red site dace, 
um, that was right there, but you can see so many different species interacting. So you can get a sense of, you know, are there any, are species schooling with their own species? Are they interacting with other species? Um, are there any antagonistic behaviors happening? Um, so I don't know, I just really love this video. I wanted to share it with you, but there's so many different fishes and uh, yeah, so I think cameras are a great tool to see what's happening underwater and how species are interacting and behaving with each other. And another video for behavior is this red side dace here. I, you might not have caught that, that was really fast. But here it's actually jumping out and eating some detritus that's floating up in the water column. And I think this is super interesting because we were under the impression that they really are insectivores. They really just uh, feed on these terrestrial uh, insects, but what we see here is they're actually kind of feeding on other things. So there could be some new discoveries out there uh, that still need to be made on the behavior, feeding behavior, mating behavior of different freshwater fishes, and we won't ever find that out until um, we put these cameras underwater and collect that information. Um, so with that, I'd just like to acknowledge all my co-authors, all the field and lab tech that assisted me with all the research programs and all the funding that I've received over the past few years. And thank you. Awesome. I'll get you to leave your slides up just because some of the questions are about specific things that you've talked about. Yeah, but thank you course. for a wonderful presentation. Lots of great questions in the chat. Before we get into the Q&A, Nicole is going to be putting in a survey link so people can let us know how we did today. If there are other topics that you would like to see in future webinars, this is the place to tell us. And if you also have a specific speaker <clears throat> in mind that you would like to see featured, that would be a great spot to tell us as well. So we'll go through as many of the questions as we can. A couple of them seem pretty closely related to each other. So a common one that's coming through is a bit of a starter kit. So if people are looking to just get into community science monitoring, do you have recommendations of what kind of equipment they should buy? Or do they need any software? Is there a, maybe like a base level one that would be good do you also have a recommendation if people have a bit more access to resources? Yeah, so I'd say the most common one people are using now are just the GoPros. Um, that's the ones we've used. Uh, I think we had the Hero Black 4s. There's so many new iterations with higher resolution, et cetera. Um, we also then used um, to be able to deploy some of these cameras was um, some, the, I think they were Joby tripods. So they were these tripods that were, had very flexible legs. So sometimes we would wrap them around a rock that we had on site to lower them and keep them in position uh, with a little float to make sure we don't lose our camera. We also had custom made tripods. Um, sorry, I should have put a picture of this for larger water bodies. Um, so essentially it was just like a plastic thing that we then put the GoPro attachment on and then had um, metal legs coming out as a tripod. And those are just larger um, rigs so that we can lower them further for deeper sites. And um, those were commonly used in lake studies in Lake Malawi from colleagues of mine in the South African Institute for Aquatic Biodiversity. And then there was also, you know, baited versus unbaited. All of my work was unbaited. Um, I didn't want to deal with the potential influence of what baiting could happen. Uh, could have on on getting the information um, in terms of and, and I, I'm assuming any underwater camera would be great I just think uh, GoPros are just the most accessible right now and easiest to use um, but I could be wrong with that um, and they have good battery life as well in terms of software I used um, a free online software called Boris, um, Boris observation. Essentially, we could upload our videos to the software, put in hotkeys. So if I knew it was a common shiner, maybe I'd mark that as a C, red, um, red side days was R or unknown, lots of unknowns. And then the video would run and I would just press the hotkeys and then it would populate <clears throat> all the species that um, I found with a timestamp. So that can give you a good, that would just facilitate some of the data collection um, part of the video analysis. Um, was that everything? 
of course, there's other softwares, but they're paid and I'm not super familiar with them, but I'm assuming the, um, there would be more information online. Great. Our next question <clears throat> is, if you found any information through your own research or other papers, if there's a best time of day to set up the cameras so you can maximize detection based on the fish, and then if you put any consideration into where the cameras went, like if it was a shaded area, is it a full sun area, that sort of thing. Yeah, so we were kind of limited in when and where to place the cameras based on the stream. So some streams were much more open, some were closed. Um, in my occupancy models, I did um, take that type of information down when I was at the site, whether you know there was open canopy, what the percentage of coverage was over the thing. And that didn't seem to affect the detection probability because um, I put all those var uh, variables in to understand which uh, variables might be affecting the detection probability. In terms of morning or Evening, uh, we usually worked from nine to five. We do one side in the morning, one side in the afternoon, and there didn't seem to be any um, effect of AM or PM on our detection probability. But this would also probably depend on the type of fish you're targeting. So if you're targeting a fish that's you know, more active at dusk and dawn, you might not capture it in the middle of the afternoon. Um, so it really depends on if you're targeting a specific fish, more interested in the full community. So you'd probably want to pick a time that would be ideal for whatever your goals are. Um, we always place them, although I did notice sometimes if it was shady, it was a bit harder to see because sometimes you'd have like, you know, the tree or a bush wafting over it and it would cause a shadow. Um, but there's only so much you can, can do about that, um, especially if you wanted to sample a bunch of different environments. <clears throat> And in terms of how the camera were facing, so I put it facing upstream because that's um, what the literature was doing at the time. However, when I was reviewing, and this is anecdotal, reviewing a lot of the videos, I did find it that the fish orient themselves upstream to keep upright. So sometimes I would just have a whole bunch of fish facing upstream and all I can see is their tail or a bit of their body. So it might, this still needs to be tested, whether we want to place it downstream to get, you know, more of a frontal view or maybe even on the sides to get a better capture of uh, the side of the fish. Um, and this, this was mostly when the water was flowing a little faster. So in these pool environments that like you can see here, not a big deal, the water's not moving much. So the fish are coming back and forth. But if, you know, there's a lot of you know, velocity coming down, then it would be really hard to ID the fish. So that's still something that needs to be tested, the orientation of the camera for sure. Okay, perfect. We have someone asking about not, um, sorry, it's just moved. Okay, different question. Were the cameras, sand nets, and electrofishing methods used on close populations of known size to determine the rate of detection? Uh, so not known size per se, because uh, we didn't really have that information for red side days. Um, they were sites we knew they were present in the past for a lot of them, um, but they were closed sites. I think that was part of the question I saw as well. So we did block net the downstream and upstream portion. So we knew that whatever we were capturing in this area would be the same fish, or hopefully if we set our block nets right, the same fish as that we were electrofishing, um, but not known abundance or amount. Um, that was always kind of a surprise to us. Okay, we have a question about <clears throat> iNaturalist. So you had mentioned that as a tool to help with identification, but do you have any other recommendations for improving identification skills, maybe even before you use iNaturalist? Yeah, so it's really hard. Um, I did all the ROM, the Royal Ontario Museum fish identification courses, which obviously is not fish underwater. Um, it's just, I think, just a ton of practice. Um, I also did a lot of 
tank experiments uh, before and during uh, my field experiments where I manipulated turbidity um, in these large tanks and I had no number of fish, uh, known fish species. <clears throat> And I think maybe just going through those videos, so I had it from zero NTU, so zero turbidity to, I forget how much to see how detection probability uh, is in, impacts that uh, for abundance estimates. And um, yeah, I'm sorry, I really don't have an answer other than keep doing it, ask your colleagues if you're IDing right. If there was any doubt, I just would put unknown. Um, or, or put it in the family of fishes um, that they belong to. Um, quick and confident, it just takes practice. Um, even now I hadn't done this in like two, three years since I started my biologist position at DFO and I was reviewing these videos I was putting up and I kind of smirked. Uh, I was like, wow, I was really confident <laughs> with my ability to see if these, these videos, because uh, some of them are really turbid and really hard to identify. So it's just, it's just practice. and hours and hours of work, but hopefully eventually machine learning will satisfy the quick and confident eventually. Great. And some of the things that you have mentioned throughout this presentation <laughs> will go out in your handout. So some of the journals that have been mentioned and some of the <clears throat> summary tables will all go in that handout for people. So if you want a quick one pager to reference back to, if this is a type of project you'd like to run maybe this spring or summer in your community, you'll have that ready to go. Uh, we are at time. So I think we will leave the Q&A there. What we can do is if people have burning questions, they can always send us a message and we can pass them over to you. Um, but just to be respectful of people's times, I do have uh, us at the one hour mark here. So we'll send a follow-up email early next week with the handout, the recording, as well as some resources that were mentioned today. And in return, if you have questions, you can email us at info, I-N-F-O at watersheds, W-A-T-E-R-S-H-E-D-S dot PA. That's our email. And you can send those messages and just reference today's webinar and we can pass those along and get some answers for you. So thank you so much everyone to join for joining us today. And thank you Rashira for a wonderful presentation and enjoy the rest of your days, everyone. Thank you so much.